uh, unofficial hello to you and welcome <laughs> to uh, this webinar. And um, I, I'm so happy that uh, you could make it and across the globe. So it will be really nice and we look forward to hearing from you. And uh, may I just uh, introduce you to the chairperson uh, we have with us, Dr. Professor Vel Pandian. He is uh, a senior professor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences and actively working with uh, drug research and special focus on ocular uh, drug research. So he's there with you. And uh, Dr. Ajit Thakur, he's uh, also assistant professor at uh, our uh, organization, and he's also actively working in neuro. And, uh, we have quite a few, over 50 participants uh, for most of the webinars. And um, there are teachers from across the country and uh, some research scholars as well. So I'm sure we will all have a nice interactive session. Uh, uh, so you can uh, just unofficially say uh, hello, okay. Dr. Pata, before we officially start. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, namaskar, yes. Dr. Pata. Yeah, Namaskar. Thanks uh, for for uh, attending this seminar and for moderating the session. Yes, uh, we are very glad to, I'm very glad to meet you uh, virtually, although, but it's very interesting that uh, you don't get opportunity to meet people, especially those who are in companies, uh, rarely we meet in, in academic, uh, uh, common academic platforms. So we are very happy to have you here. Yeah, you know, next time, if you, if you share your connection with me, I visit Delhi quite often. Sure, please, please. My, I mean, we would be very happy to. We will so, be very happy to host you. Uh, yeah. We have a uh, um, Delhi Pharmacological Society is uh, uh, it's affiliated to Indian Pharmacology Society, but actively involved in uh, you know the all academic uh, uh, type of activities. We'll be we'll be very happy to have you there. Sure. You come sometime I, to Delhi. Yeah, I come to Delhi quite often. Oh, you know, okay. at least. Uh, non-COVID times because my in-laws are there. So oh, wonderful. I, that, that's definitely you must uh, drop in next yeah. time. So uh, I think I will take your email, we'll share it, you know, so that uh, you can drop in. Yes, yes. I you think know, Arjun can, can also forward my connection to you. And definitely. also, you know, I, I support the ocular research in oh, well. okay. Jackson. So, you know, there's something we can certainly connect on. Wonderful. That'll be, that'll be great. That'll be great. And sorry, oh, Ajit, I couldn't meet you. Uh, I, I was planning, I was scheduled to come to Delhi uh, and meet, you know, folks at Dipsar, but uh, I was there in Delhi, but other things cropped up, so I couldn't make it. Okay. To, you know. I'm very happy that you're from Jadavar University. Really good. Yeah. I spent <laughs> uh, both my bachelor's and master's. Okay. There. Okay. Great, <laughs> very nice. I'm in the U.S. for over thirty years now. <laughs> <laughs> you you gave a lecture uh, uh, recently uh, to other platform also, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, this is yeah. interesting uh, that Dr. Patha is supporting Ocular, and uh, I didn't know about this, but then it, this is a good coincidence, and Dr. Exactly. Delpandian is also active in uh, <laughs> Ocular, so it's a great connection, and um, so I think we are already there, so most of uh, us are already logged in. Dr. Velpandian, you can make the official introductions, and oh, yes, uh, we can... Yes, Dr. Ajit, uh, please first introduce Dr. Uh, Velpandian, you know he's a senior pharmacologist, and then we can get started. So, uh, very good morning, all of you. Officially, it is now uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Vel Pandeshan. Uh, sir is a senior professor at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. And uh, sir is working in the field of ocular pharmacology and his renowned uh, lab setup in the lab. I have also visited uh, that lab. Uh, sir is making some uh, innovative uh, model, animal model, even the uh, fish model I have seen there. So lots of work is going on with the such lab. And really, uh, I am happy to introduce sir in the platform. Uh, you are uh, enjoying uh, already. You have enjoyed the sir lecture yesterday, and uh, today sir is the chairman, chairperson in the session. And uh, the speaker of our uh, today's uh, lecture is uh, uh, Dr. Partha Nandi. Uh, sir is the senior director of clinical pharmacology and pharmacometry Johnson and uh, research and uh, Janssen research and uh, development center and Dr. Partha received the bachelor's and master's degree in pharmacy from India 
he did phd in pharmaceutical computational science from the university of southern california in 1994 and post doctoral research at university of california los angeles dr partha has been associated to purdue pharma and bristol myers civic group leader and senior research investigator as well as jjprd as a associate director in 2006 ams group us as a director mbdd group as a head of biological modeling cppm group leader of cardiovascular metabolism and neurosciences dr partha has made significant contribution to several program in anti infective oncology and neuroscience francis chaise the including the uh, uh, do P, uh, tori payment and oxo oxajolidones uh, septo bipro and uh, tapentadol and uh, fulranumab and abira terone in his current role of uh, regional cp head he is responsible for overseeing all cp activity in the oncology immunology cvm and ts and sts and dr bartha has authored several book authored and more than 50 manuscript i and one book chapters and numerous abstracts so we are we welcome uh, dr uh, parthan and sir in the qip uh, session today and sir is going to uh, deliver the lecture in the field of uh, uh, that uh, uh, how clinical pharmacology shape the strategy of clinical drug development from enemy and registration and the second lecture sir will deliver the enhancing research and development productivity through identification of risk and development of innovative mitigation strategies so we welcome and uh, welcome ma'am and uh, all the participant in the uh, today's uh, sixth day uh, qip program so uh, and as well as i uh, also uh, congratulate and wish you happy uh, hard world hard day today is uh, happy uh, world hard day also so we are happy and healthy and smiling today thank you welcome sir yeah, i mean let me just a uh, few words about uh, uh, dr partha the one most interesting thing for this group uh, uh, qip participants and as well as all of us the most interesting thing is that somebody who has an expertise on pkpd uh, drug modeling is something that you know we always uh, we appreciate the people those who have such a type of expertise and uh, the most interesting thing is that while you try to scale the preclinical studies to clinical uh, development this expertise comes into a plays a big picture therefore uh, so he has handled those things at uh, see unlike uh, in academic uh, setup when you are working in industry you ought to be well very well focused on development programs and dr partha the 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 program in which he is he has been involved seems to be very very interesting especially um uh, abiratron is even you know we we study the cp even today in our cancer patients it's it seems very it's, it's very very really <clears throat> interesting molecule even today for us to work with so with this expertise i think uh, our lecture what is he going to talk about will be really of uh, sense because the man who worked with these molecules is going to talk about i think our qap participants will be highly benefited by this talk and uh, we are uh, once again that we are very happy to have you here sir please yeah uh, thank you dr val pandian and and dr ajit for very nice and kind introduction um if i fade out a little bit while talking please excuse me it's past midnight here so if i fall asleep i'll try to stay awake <laughs> just a uh, disclosure uh, maybe i'll i'll share my screen um so give me a minute I sure. hope I so i'm i'm not sure if i'm the made the presenter from the administration side uh you want any help sir um am i the presenter now uh we we have to see your slides yes i'm trying to share but it won't 
let me share the screen yes. uh, just open it in your uh, screen then you go for share screen uh, that's better yeah uh, uh, i request uh, the host qip host to please make dr patha as co-host Uh, Dr. Sachin, if you're logged in, please make Dr. Partha as co-host. Partha, uh, sir, is there? Okay. Uh. Partha, sir. Yeah, Partha, sir, is host. Okay, let me see what's going on here. Uh, sir, below one screen, there's share a screen. Uh, maybe if you did first time, then they will take the permission to share in your computer. My screen keeps on flickering. Just to give me a minute, I think. Can you see it now? Oh, yes, yes it's, sir, coming. Yes. it's coming. Yes, it is it's coming. Now click on the, the full list, sir, please. Yeah. Okay. Is it better? Yeah. It's, uh, okay. Yes, that's no. good. All right, I think I have it. How do I get rid of this? Okay, can you see my, okay, sorry. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Is, is it good? Hello? Yes, sir, yes, sir. We could okay. see you, good. please go ahead. Good. Yep. Um, let me see how to move this window because it's going to, I don't know what's going on. Let's let's try to move on. So um, thank you all for joining this morning's session on um, the role of clinical pharmacology in drug development. I'll cover um, two basic concepts today. One is what I call the hardcore clinical pharmacology, and the second uh, topic will cover some of the modeling aspects that uh, has become part and parcel of clinical pharmacology. Um, so, okay. So, um, you know, just to begin with, with uh, you know, how drug development and uh, is, 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 is perceived in, in general, you know, we look at a pill and we think all pills are made equal. Unfortunately, that's not the case. We have, uh, um, you know, have to design our molecule, uh, a product in a way that fits the physical chemical property of a drug substance and also it fits the need of the disease that uh, one is trying to treat. So uh, what are the, over, you know, when we talk of drug development in general, it, cover, it spans a, a pretty broad spectrum. So we start with our engagement in the discovery and the screening process of new molecular entity. Um, clinical pharmacology is involved in preclinical development um, then we covered the clinical development, which is phase one through phase three. 
Um, we um, are also involved post approval, which is phase four. That's where we do a uh, line extension, which also sometimes referred to as life cycle management. Um, and all, all, all along this development continuum, clinical pharmacology plays a very critical role in, in how a, a product is designed and what kind of studies are done and basically how does one get to the label um, that we all are very familiar with. So um, there are few activities that ClinPharm is engaged in in uh, different stages of drug development. So in early stages, the key questions that a clinical pharmacologist answers are, you know, what are the, uh, which candidates are most likely to succeed? Um, what are the biomarkers that one should capture in preclinical models and also whether or not those biomarkers could be tracked in the clinic and uh, how relevant are these biomarkers in terms of capturing the disease progression or a drug activity. And finally, what dose range is needed to compete with the leaders in the drug class? And this is a very important uh, consideration, not only uh, for the patients, but also for the commercial aspect, because if you need a very large dose, um, you know, oftentimes it's very difficult to manufacture. And likewise, if the dose is very small, um, it requires special manufacturing techniques. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes the cost of goods and the cost of formulation could overshadow the therapeutic benefit. In the development stage, um, we look at what I call uh, disease uh, in, in indication prioritization. So we look at what indications are most promising for a given compound. Um, obviously here we try to optimize the dose even further. Uh, we try to look at what uh, is known as therapeutic index. We try to look at the safety efficacy of a molecule in that disease. Also look, also consider the clinical benefit, the risk benefit of the molecule, and then uh, design an optimal dosing regimen, a dose and dosing regimen. And finally, what is the drug product profile relative to competitors because that gives us a marketing advantage. As the molecule progresses to approval and post approval stage, um, we um, answer you know, some of the key questions outlined here. So the first thing is about differentiation. How do we differentiate our product from other products that are already in the market? This question is, is not as critical for first in class or, or the first drug that enters into the market for a particular disease area. But we always consider this because there is always competition. Um, there is, in today's day and age, there's hardly any disease area where there is only one solitary drug that's being developed. You'll see at least five to 10 minimum um, competition that you have to foresee and prepare for. So. Those are the kind of things we we um, uh, keep in our rear view mirror as we develop our drugs. The second most important question is how do we facilitate market access? This is uh, probably not that acute in some parts of the world, but in 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 US and Europe, market access is a big uh, question mark where healthcare is is paid by uh, you know, uh, caregivers and, and uh, third party payers. So uh, it's, it's seldom paid out of pocket. So there is this, this um, you know, entity that uh, always challenges and evaluates um, the risk benefit and the utility of the treatment. And finally, what other indications is the drug likely to succeed? And this forms our key life cycle management strategy. 
Um, so um, what we have here is um, uh, there are three pillars that we often talk about in drug development. Um, one is the, the first one is the exposure at the site of action. Second is binding to the pharmacological target. And third is expression of uh, functional pharmacological activity. And um, all these are connected through uh, drug exposure. Um, this is a paper that was published by Pfizer in 2012, where they looked at all their phase two assets um, across all their therapeutic areas in development over the past 10 years. And what they did is they categorized the, their um, knowledge into a two by two table um, which is um, you know, pretty much a chi-square kind of table where you have on one hand on the y-axis, if you may, um, the uh, high confidence in exposure versus low confidence in exposure. And along the x-axis, uh, low confidence in pharmacology and high confidence in pharmacology. And if you look at um, the, their rate, the success rate, you can see that of the 12 phase two studies where they had low confidence in both uh, exposure and pharmacology, all of them failed. They couldn't start a single phase three study. Um, where they had low confidence in exposure, but high confidence in pharmacology of the six phase two studies, there were zero starts of phase three. So the results were quite dismal, but there was slightly better hope with the uh, you know, in the boxes that are colored yellow. Uh, when one has a very high confidence in exposure and pharmacology, usually the success rate is very high. And, uh, you know, in some of these cases, one could use smart study design, uh, which we will be calling it as uh, futility analysis or sample size re-estimation or adaptive study designs. And all these are meant to investigate, you know, this, this particular uh, area with minimum impact on budget. So you could um, have a early stopping based on some futility criteria. Uh, sometimes the studies fail because we improperly um, estimate a sample size. So if we can do sample size re-estimation in a blinded manner, one could increase the probability of success of such studies. And adaptive design is really to adapt on a multiple on multiple fronts, either be the dose, the dosing regimen, the patient characteristics. And this gives us the most flexibility in exploring um, where the drug uh, is likely to work in which patient population, what doses, what kind of regimen, are there any specific sub uh, set of pop, uh, patients that will that could respond to the drug better than the others. So it, it's really, you know, when I talk about adaptive design, it's, it's adapting across all these domains. And uh, you can see, you know, these are the percentages. Um, I think uh, going from phase two to phase three of 50, 60% success rate is actually excellent, um, you know, in, in, in today's day and age and for the diseases that uh, are still, uh, you know, um, doesn't have a, a, a robust uh, therapeutic option. So in terms of um, drug development, as you can imagine that um, in early phase, we need to manage the knowledge very carefully and be very aggressive in developing that knowledge. But as a molecule progresses towards late development, it's mostly management of the risk that becomes critical. Um, this is a, uh, a, a summary of the kind of modeling that goes along with clinical pharmacology um, uh, and and you know it it spans uh, a wide range of, uh, of of model building 
exercises. Some are directed towards pharmacology, some are directed towards understanding the PKPD of the drug, some to understand the pharmacokinetics of the drug, um, others are more geared towards understanding the disease progression. Um, but I want to also highlight a couple of other modeling subtypes which are not quite common in, 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 in our, our daily drug development practice. One is the outcomes model. This is something that is becoming very uh, very in, you know, important as, um, you know, understanding how a patient um, perceives a treatment effect, um, which is what we found out is uh, that could be very different than a standard uh, PKPD endpoint. The other thing that we have found to be very important is, a, is understanding the dropout model, because sometimes you could have informative versus non-informative dropouts, and that could affect your overall statistical analysis. Um, and sometimes there are very nice examples in the literature where one could see that a, a very promising drug just failed to show efficacy in phase three because the dropout model was, was not adequately characterized. Finally, last but not the least is the adherence model. Uh, in phase three, many drugs fail because of adherence, because um, it's the most unsupervised phase of the study or a drug development process, and their patients just do not take the drug. Um, so there are models that are out there that one could implement, and these are usually um, associated with understanding of the PK of the drug. Uh, and uh, you know, using these kind of models also helps to understand you know, what's the true drug effect versus you know, and uh, versus what what the results of a phase three study often shows. Finally, uh, modeling is used very heavily in pediatric drug development space. Um, the days of treating uh, pediatric patients as little adults are gone. Um, a lot of advancement has happened in the pediatric pharmacology drug disposition area to enable robust drug development process. And sometimes the diseases that we treat with the same drug uh, in, in a pediatric population is not exactly the same as that of the adult. We could, it could be very different indication or even the disease could progress very differently. So understanding the disease models in pediatric patients is also very, very critical. Um, so what do we do along this continuum? So very early on, we improve or influence the first in human dose selection through implementation of different kinds of modeling exercises, uh, whether it be PK, PB, PK, PD, which is pharmacologically based, uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling as, and uh, link that to the pharmacodynamics. We do translational modeling, understanding um, the PKPD relationship between preclinical uh, disease models and how that translates into humans, both in terms of disease and uh, exposure response. We also have come a long way in developing systems of biology model, looking at how the mechanism of the disease and the, and the treatment intervention lead to uh, a, a treatment effect that is clinically meaningful. And uh, you know there are other modeling approaches also that are applied from time to time, and some of these could be pure statistical models. Um, in this, in in sort of mid-stage development, we improve and influence the probability of success of the of proof of concept studies by improving its design and choosing the right dose. Um, there are several levels of innovation that. Uh, we undertake in phase two, three. These are usually PB, PKPD guided decision making. Now you hear the term model informed drug development. Um, we also look at landscape analysis, and I'm going to cover some of this in my next talk, just to give you a flavor of what these analysis 
and modeling look like and how they inform drug development. And finally, um, you know, towards the later half of the development or uh, as we look into life cycle management of compounds, we look at, um, you know, the disease models. Uh, we try to um, correlate different diseases to see um, where a particular drug could be used as well. Um, landscape analysis is a way to differentiate uh, one molecule uh, from the competition and other treatments that are out there in a disease area. We keep on improving our formulation um, and the PBPK you know, lends us a, a very good support there. And uh, I think it's fair to say that the translational models and the exposure response models are are done all the way through um, in, in, in all stages of drug development. Um, these are the typical uh, study types that a clinical pharmacologist would conduct in a, a program. Um, I'm not going to read them all, but I want to highlight one area, which is the immunogenicity. Uh, this is um, a, a, a typically done for large molecule programs, which are monoclonal antibodies or peptides or, or small proteins, which has some immunogenic uh, properties. Um, but sometimes some small molecules could also behave as haptans. And uh, these are usually de-risked early at very early stages. Um, I also want to highlight some special studies that we often do, which are not on that list. And, and those are what I call this clinical safety form, uh, clin clinical pharmacology safety study, which includes uh, assessment of thoracuity, which includes assessment of photosensitivity of a compound. It's mostly I'm talking of small molecules here. And uh, you know, all these uh, find its way into the label and, and how the products are sometimes packaged and administered. So uh, just to highlight you know, um, some of the study types that we undertake and at, at different stages of development, um, I'm not going to read all of this, but you know, it's fair to say that in a, in a global world, we also have to understand the need of, uh, of other, you know, uh, uh, in, in other uh, marketing territories. So uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of a drug in different patient population uh, of different ethnicity. Um, so a lot of bridging studies are done to understand whether pharmacokinetics and dynamics in a Caucasian population can be uh, applied to um, Japanese, Chinese, Indian, and, and, and people of other ethnic origins. Uh, because in a global world, you know, we are developing drugs for a global community, not just, you know, um, a small cross section of the community. Um, we also spend a lot of time investigating the drug-drug interaction potential. If the molecule is a small molecule, I'm going to spend some time on that during my talk today. Um, because if you look at any small molecule label, you'll see a large section devoted to drug-drug interaction, whether it's enzyme-driven or transporter-mediated. And uh, you know, as we are getting more and more into um, into you know diseases that uh, are are quite uh, exotic, we are finding some pretty exotic uh, transporters as well. And uh, in that particular area, the knowledge of transporter, how it behaves, kinetics and dynamics, is is not always very well known. Um, one of the other area that uh, you know we do studies very early on is the ADME study, which is using radio label compound, we characterize the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of drug. Uh, that, that helps us define the property of a molecule very precisely, and it also informs subsequent developments. Um, one other 
piece the, which, which forms part and parcel of clinical pharmacology is the biopharmaceutic aspect. Uh, these usually encompasses um, uh, studies like bioequivalence, bioavailability of new formulations, um, and food effect. That's a, a, that's a key um, contribution of, of clinical pharmacologists in, in the drug development space. Um, so how do we affect the label? So if you look at these different uh, study types, you can see we have a pretty large contribution in the dose and administration section. We have a large contribution in the contraindication section, drug-drug interaction, um, um, use of the drug in special population, um, whether it be at pregnancy, lactation, pediatric, geriatric use, in cardiac disorder, hepatic and renal impairment. And then, as you all know, in a label, there is an entire section, section 12, at least in, in, in US FDA label, that is solely devoted to clinical pharmacology. And uh, this is, and, and you know, we as clinical pharmacologists take this responsibility pretty seriously because this is where the safety efficacy of a drug is calibrated. And uh, you know the doses are are um, are um, identified for a given indication. So we do play a very critical role in the drug development process. Um, moving on, um, some of the key features, as most of you know, that there are different classification systems that has come about over the years where we look at a drug elimination classification, transporter effects and food effect. And, uh, you know, typically most of the small molecules will fall into one of these two buckets, but there will be instances where you will encounter um, drugs that will uh, transition from one bucket to the other based on those. Um, because there are drugs um, that, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, at higher doses will lose the solubility property and they could transition between class two and class four. And those are the kind of things one needs to be mindful of during development because yes, you know, uh, when a chemist made a molecule, they, they might have classified the molecule as a class two molecule, which is the the middle panel, um, but you know, at the end of the day, sometimes when you have a larger dose that you need to treat a disease, you could very well be in a class four state. And, and they, these uh, classes are very well characterized and there are very specific requirements that one has to follow in, in order to uh, design a robust clean farm program. Um, so, amongst all the studies that a clinical pharmacologist would do, I'm going to focus on some of this today. Um, obviously, the list is endless. We tailor our programs based on the need, based on the disease area, the patient population, and the physical chemical property of a compound. So, um, you know, you know, we'll not have time to go over each of these. Uh, different types of studies that one conducts, but uh, I'll, I'll try to um, touch upon some of the key ones. Um, so this is the drug development paradigm in brief. If you look at the continuum, um, we do different studies at different stages of development. We typically try to de-risk our drug-drug interaction uh, profile uh, the special population in terms of PK uh, in renal and hepatic impairment for acuity before a molecule enters phase two, phase three. Uh, once a molecule enters that stage, we typically monitor the exposure in those patient population, and we focus more on exposure response, understanding the disease progression and how exposure response are impacting the disease progression. Uh, we, we try to complete all the clean form activity prior to phase three. But as you all are very familiar with and aware of that, it's not always, you know, um, 
it's not written in stone. There are always things that are happening in parallel to phase three. And these, what I refer to as labeling studies, um, there are some um, drug-drug interaction or biopharmaceutics work that goes on in parallel to phase three, which is very typical in any drug development program. But they, uh, they do not uh, provide any critical knowledge uh, that could impact or alter the phase three study design or conduct. So uh, we, we carefully um, optimize our plan um, and if there are any risk, we triage them upfront. So we do not carry risk into phase three. Um, this is just to show some of the special population studies which are done sometimes based on the patient population. Um, there are a whole host of guidances that are available at the FDA site. These are usually FDA ICH joint guidances, so they are applicable to drug development in general across the globe and, and, um, and majority of the regions um, do subscribe to, to this uh, you know, to, to these guidances. So it makes easy, it makes it easy upon a drug developer to create a globally acceptable clinical pharmacology strategy and not have to do studies to meet the regional needs. Although, you know, sometimes we, we, we have done that and we do that uh, based on um, the region and what is different uh, between the populations, of, you know, uh, in, in in that region compared to rest of the world. Um, so this is the ADMI, um, sorry. So this is the ADMI study. Typically uh, we do these studies with C14 labeled drug. Recently, uh, there's a lot of interest in, in generating C13 label, which is a stable uh, carbon isotope. Um, what it does is it reduces the risk of radiation in patients and it's a lot safer to handle. Um, unlike C14, which requires special precaution, uh, C13 does not. Um, so we are also experimenting um, with the deuterated molecule. Typically we don't do, um, uh, we don't use deuterated molecule because of the, uh, the risk of um, uh, exchange and uh, isotopic dilution. So we stay away from that, but sometimes we have no other choice because if it's too hard to label a molecule at the carbon unit, then, um, you know, we often fall, fall back upon uh, uh, labeling the, the a hydrogen with the tritium or, or a deuterium. Um, the primary information that we gain from this study is uh, understanding the elimination and excretion of a drug from the body. Um, but uh, the most importantly, we need to characterize the, the proportion of the drug that gets converted from parent to metabolite. Um, we don't do it quite often in, in human studies, but you know, if, if you are in neuroscience, you know, we use radio labeled molecules to do PET imaging. Um, and uh, also we sometimes use this to understand the localization of a drug in certain organs. Um, whole body autoradiography is not that common in humans, but sometimes it's done to understand where the drug distributes. And, you know, in, in old days when there was, uh, the, the technology wasn't that developed, for targeted therapies, one would often do a radio labeled whole body imaging to see if the drug is reaching the site of action, um, you know, adequately to exert the pharmacological effect. But those studies are getting much rare as, as time uh, goes by. You know, there are other sophisticated techniques that can now be used. Um, this is the BAB study. I think uh, all of you are very familiar with this concept. Um, a BA study is typically done when we compare different formulations um, to understand the bioavailability of one formulation over the other. 
Bioequivalence is a special case of bioavailability where we are um, changing the formulation, but we don't change the formulation type. So a tablet is compared to tablet. All that changes are sometimes the source of the API, some formulation process, site of manufacturing, etc. But more and more as we are doing this, we try to develop a in vitro in vivo correlation models nowadays that gives us uh, the freedom to change within a certain sp uh, specification, the API quality, the formulation, um, you know, changes, manufacturing site, manufacturing instrument, etc. So you'll see more uh, in vitro in vivo correlations being developed. And typically you see that for a sustained release product, but I'm seeing that more and more even for immediate release product as well, because companies do not want to keep doing bioequivalent studies every time they have to move around a product from one manufacturing site to another. Um, now, B studies are not needed for class one compound, which are highly soluble and highly permeable. Um, but sometimes we have been able to get waiver on class three molecules as well, uh, depending on the concentrate, uh, the, the dose. But for class uh, two and class four molecules, which are usually low permeability molecules um, and one of, um, you know, high solubility and low solubility, uh, we often, um, you know, end up doing a BE study. Um, this is the food effect. I think this is also very familiar to most of you. We use uh, typically a high fat, high calorie meal to assess the food effect, but sometimes we do have to conduct a very specialized food effect investigation because there are drugs whose bioavailability, hence the exposure, is affected by high calorie uh, uh, diets also um, of, of different nature. So high protein could have a different effect than a high carb or a high fat meal. Um, in addition to that, we, you know, in some cases we run studies in presence of alcohol because many sustained release drugs and the polymers that are used could be compromised in presence of alcohol, which could lead to dose dumping and, and, and pose a risk to the patient. So those studies are typically classified in the same category as food effect, but uh, we alter food um, composition and content. The other piece which is often seen for some drugs is that the timing of food relative to dosing is also an important uh, factor. And, um, if you look at the aberaterone label, you know, you'll see some very strict guidance around when the drug should be taken, you know, uh, in relation to food intake. Um, and there's a reason for that because the PK property, the bioavailability is affected by the content of the food and the timing of the food. And all those we try to um, de-risk in the very early, uh, you know, during the very early stages of development. Um, this is a decision tree for renal impairment studies. Uh, typically, you know, one would conduct a full, uh, what I call the fully loaded study, where you look at the drug, uh, the effect of your drug, uh, uh, the PK of your drug on renal, different renal impairment status and hepatic impairment status, which I'm going to cover very shortly. But more and more, what uh, the companies are doing is they are doing a reduced design. So they start off with the severe renal or hepatic impairment and work their way up. And where they see that the, if the, these uh, intrinsic factors do not affect drug exposure by any means, they stop the study. This not only helps with uh, preserving the, the patients uh, like or subjects, you don't want to, to expose subjects unnecessarily to a drug because every drug is toxic to a certain degree. 
um, but also, you know, you don't want to generate data that's not meaningful. So if let's say you're, uh, there is no effect of mild hepatic or renal impairment on the PK and exposure of a drug, then you could very easily use the same dose in your phase three study that, that you would use in, for, a, for a subject with normal renal and hepatic function. Um, so, you know, we use a very streamlined approach to doing these studies nowadays. Um, typically, you know, there are many different ways of measuring renal um, function. Um, Cockroft Gold is one of the most commonly used. And uh, if you uh, see the evolution of the renal guidance from FDA and ICH, there's been some changes in recent years uh, where the categorization has been altered. Uh, one other thing that I want to mention here that uh, for certain diseases, uh, we also do studies in hemodialysis and acute kidney injury uh, patients because the pharmacokinetics of the drug, particularly those that are affected by renal function, um, are, are you know um, need some assessment um, because sometimes you may run into a situation where one needs to supplement additional drug after a hemodialysis session. Uh, the other aspect of uh, renal function that could, if it could, could influence your drug disposition is um, its effect on metabolism. Some of the toxins that are not filtered could affect your enzyme status, uh, drug metabolizing enzyme status, um, and therefore you could see uh, a concomitant alteration in the in 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 drug drug interaction potential um, in in presence of uh, you know renal impairment as well. So those are the kind of things that one needs to watch out for in early development to to de-risk and and come up with a strategy that that could allow you to come up with a uh, a dose in in these uh, special. Uh, populations. Uh, this is the same thing, uh, but this is uh, uh, in, in related to the hepatic impairment. Again, we follow very similar paradigm uh, as I uh, described in case of renal uh, uh, renal impairment. And uh, here too, you know, these these uh, particular subjects are very hard to recruit. There are only few sites in, around the world where they have a pool of uh, subjects who are, you know, um, have hepatic impairment um, in the child, child PU, A, B, and C category. C being the severe, B the moderate, and A the mild hepatic impaired. Um, and so we are we are very cautious um, in in exploring uh, the the liability of our molecule in in these patient population. And we take a minimalistic approach, start with the words, go up. In some cases, if we know that we don't want to get a label for this drug in uh, severe hepatic impaired patients, we start with mo moderate and work up to mild. But as soon as we see the exposures are within 20, 30% of a normal population, you know, we stop, we don't continue uh, with the drug. These are usually very small studies, 10 to 12 subjects in each of these categories. Sometimes we have done it with six subjects as well, uh, because it's, as I said, it's difficult to enroll. Um, these are some of the considerations. Uh, lately, um, if you look into the literature, a lot of emphasis has been put on um, using a population pharmacokinetic approach in understanding the, the effect of, uh, you know, understanding the pharmacokinetics in these special populations. Um, there is also a large part of our time that's spent on understanding um, the, the role genetic polymorphism of SIP enzymes play. Um, sometimes we have also encountered polymorphism in the transport, at the transporter level and all those 
are usually uh, investigated in phase three to understand whether these have any implication on, on pharmacodynamics as well. And there are some examples where we have seen these genetic polymorphisms not only leads to alterations in PK, but also has a profound effect on the pharmacodynamics of a drug. Um, this is a very busy slide, but you can look at it um, in, in the DDI guidance um, from FDA and ICH. Uh, this tells us, you know, when to conduct a in vivo human drug-drug interaction study. All our drug-drug uh, interaction investigation starts up with the in uh, vitro um, experiments. And once we reach a certain criteria, we decide whether or not to conduct in vivo. Uh, one of the um, experimental design that is gaining in popularity is what I what is known as the cocktail approach, where you can evaluate um, the likelihood of uh, different SIP enzymes affecting your compound and your compound affecting different SIP enzymes all in one study using different probes. Um, there's some risk to it. You have to design the study very carefully um, there are you know, interactions of these probes amongst themselves. So, um, you know, you need to understand the prop, you know, uh, the full property of the metabolic property of your compound before you embark on any kind of cocktail approach. Um, we are interested both in the induction and inhibition of a molecule. Um, these studies could be both uh, crossover or parallel in design, depending on the half-life of the molecules that we are interested in studying. If it's an inducer, uh, obviously you have to be careful. Uh, you have to allow proper washout and 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 reinstate and and allow the enzyme to reinstate. Um, don't do a crossover too fast because it's going to affect your, your results. So, um, and the, these are very well laid out in the guidances. Actually, it's one of the uh, better written guidances that I have seen come out of FDA over the years. Um, the last but not the least is the thoracuity, uh, which is becoming more and more important in small molecule and sometimes even large molecule drug development that has an effect on the hemodynamic properties. Um, mostly you will see that uh, for large molecules or peptides that are used in diabetes. Um, typically, we do a four-way crossover study with a you know, placebo, uh, moxifloxacin as a standard uh, for assay sensitivity, a therapeutic dose, and then a supratherapeutic dose, just to, um, you know, lay out the, the, the range over which the drug is safe and is not going to cause any QT prolongation, which, um, you know, often leads to torsades to point and uh, you know other uh, other cardiologic uh, malfunctions. Um, typically, if you look at the guidance, which is the E14 guidance from FDA and ICH, um, you have a 10 milliseconds threshold. Um, you have to ensure in the study that you have a positive effect from moxifloxacin, and uh, so that you establish acid sensitivity and then you, you need at least two to three fold margin in your QT. Um, sometimes we do phase uh, thorough QT evaluation in our first in human study to de-risk early on. And uh, we do some uh, modeling to quantify the true risk. And, uh, you know, there are uh, provisions in the E14 guidance and, and other uh, documentation that has come out over the last four or five years that uh, one could ask for a waiver from a thoracuity study. These are very, very expensive studies. Um, you know, a, a very standard design could cost somewhere between four to five million dollars to, to conduct and report.
sort out. So we are, you know, we very, we are very careful, um, you know, when to conduct these studies, and we look at every option to get waivers on these kind of studies. I'll just uh, cover quickly the first in human um, study design and the dose selection, which is a key component of a, of, of a clinical pharmacologist role within any organization. I'm not going to go over this, but um, you know there is a alphabet soup that you will often encounter if you are working in the early uh, first in human space. Uh, there are different methodologies that came up over the years, and uh, you know they are becoming, um, you know, more relevant as time goes by uh, in terms of, um, you know, transitioning from safety-based assessments and determination of first in human dose to more pharmacologically oriented determination of first in human dose. And uh, you can see I put the PAD, which is the pharmacologically active dose at the very bottom. This is what is um, you know, being enforced by EMEA and to some extent FDA at this point. Um, the NOEL, which is the no adverse effect level based dosing are, are, are being challenged more and more. Um, MAPLE, which is a minimally anticipated biological effect level um, is applied more in, uh, you know, applied for in case of biologics or peptides, but it's also finding its way into the small molecule world. Um, in brief, um, you know, we do the Mabel approach, which is, uh, a, you know, many companies are adopting Mabel because it streamlines um, the process in, in many ways. Um, there is also a lot of emphasis on PK receptor occupancy and pharmacodynamic based approaches. Uh, PAD is something that uh, you know we use in terms of um, products where we have a very strong correlation between PK um, receptor occupancy and uh, pharm and 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 uh, clinically relevant pharmacodynamics and and and, and treatment and improvement in disease outcomes following treatment. Um, sometimes we use, um, you know, uh, a slightly different approach for drugs that are Me Too type. I think we can learn a lot from uh, PKPD of uh, our competitors to understand what is the best starting dose. Obviously in a Me Too situation, we have a better understanding and handle on safety so we can do a very truncated first in human program where we can quickly escalate to reach our target uh, or the desired dose level and don't have to burn through a lot of uh, um, cohorts to reach that point. Uh, the NOEL and the, and the, the the, the human uh, effective dose or the highest non-severity, severely toxic dose is a very old paradigm. It's being used more and more for drugs where we have more experience or diseases where we have more experience. So um, in, you'll still, still see this methodology used quite widely, but uh, it's losing favor slowly. Um, Obviously, for the starting dose, we follow the regulatory guidance. We look at, you know, we consider safety. That's our paramount, um, you know, um, criteria. Uh, we want to ensure that nobody gets harmed. Um, oftentimes, we have to make a choice between health subjects and patients. And uh, uh, most oncology drugs, which are um, of cytotoxic in nature or have uh, pharmacology that could lead to uh, unexpected toxicity like cytokine release syndrome, etc. We usually go in patients with these first in humans. Um, we are the one who designed the objective and the study design elements. These are usually multi cohort, uh, you know, um, group sequential design uh, with escalating dose cohorts. Um, we also, you know, 
contribute towards uh, development of the GCP uh, in our in our, our protocol design and uh, you know we contribute to the INDs and as you know there are different types of INDs that one could do and uh, you know we look at the best option that that uh, is available to us. Um, these are some of the standard um, uh, ways of coming up with uh, the starting dose. Typically in case of Noel, where we are translating from preclinical species to humans and that translation is, it is not always robust. We usually a safety factor of 10X. Um, in oncology, uh, we have used one sixth the dose that where we see no effect level in animals, mostly in non rodent species. Um, also, we use the one tenth or the ten x margin for the rodents. Uh, the Mabel is is to me a more pharmacologically based approach where we can evaluate the the minimally acceptable biological effect level based on the receptor occupancy or target engagement that has a direct connection to the pharmacology of the disease and, and usually is, is safe to do. Um, and wherever ap applicable, I would, um, I, I would recommend to use the Mabel approach. Um, Typically, the talk studies are, are pivotal in this case. These are done under GLP conditions. Um, there are two species, usually rodent and non-rodent, and the non-rodent species could vary between dogs to non-human primates to exotic species as marmosets sometimes and, and others as well. Um, typically, we try to keep the same route of administration between the human uh, experience and, and these uh, in vivo animal studies. We do leverage a lot of data, in vitro data like the HERG, uh, eye care channel currents for cardiovascular safety and, and uh, you know, respiratory and CNS effects from our in vivo studies. Um, gene talks, as you all know, AIMS test is very common along with the micronucleus test. Um, the understanding of photo safety, reprotox, uh, in case we want to include uh, women of childbearing potential is, is important. And uh, we'd run a battery of um, in vitro DDI and uh, biotransformation experiments to understand the biotransformation risk of this molecule, particularly if the molecule gets biotransformed into an active metabolite or a metabolite that could potentially be toxic. Um, we use these animal studies to set, and, and, and the totality of these data to set a maximum exposure limit. And typically the first in human study um, tries to keep, uh, we try to keep the exposure within that safety margin but oftentimes you'll come across exper experiences where you have, uh, you know, um, blown past the safety margin from one dog species, but you kept it, um, you know, within the, the margin set by the other dog species. And it often happens because you'll see a quite a large disparity between a rodent and a non-rodent, and there we look at the pharmacology and assess which pharmacology is, is more appropriate to humans and the disease that we are trying to treat. Um, this is already I covered the GLP talk studies in rodents are typically the longest is six months um, and in non-rodents it's nine months. And this gives us, um, you know, not only allow us to open up the first in human study but also takes us further along deep into the into the phase two three stage as well um, oncology always has a slightly different criteria um, but it varies a lot between the type of uh, compounds um, that are used in for the treatment of cancer if it's a cytotoxic versus it's an anti-metabolite versus it's a biologic or or modulates certain biology um, you know, each of these has their own own requirements. Um, 
in terms of scaling, typically, you know, allometry is, is quite common. You will see examples of Diedrich plot as well. And there are other fancy methods that one could use. But uh, typically, what I've seen so far is uh, allometry works very well in, in most cases. There are some occasions where one would require a translational modeling uh, based on systems pharmacology, uh, where the pharmacology at a cellular level is very well characterized. It gives us a better handle on translatability of a dose from preclinical to clinical. Uh, this is a picture from FDA's first in human guidance. Basically, I've covered this in 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 uh, in a nutshell. This is an overview of how you arrive at the first in human dose. Um, so finally, you know, I didn't want to talk about the math, but there is a lot of um, analysis that goes on behind the scenes. Um, some of these are very heavy model building, requires very heavy model building efforts, and. Uh, uh, our ultimate goal is to balance the safety of a starting dose um, to the efficacy and in short, define the therapeutic index much more precisely. Um, obviously with the advent of uh, new um, immuno-oncology products um, and that work that one works through cytokine uh, mediated response, one has to be careful in designing these studies about priming the system appropriately so that one doesn't get into a cytokine release syndrome, which is often fatal. And there are examples where patients have died because, um, you know, early on in, in when when uh, you know scientists didn't have much experience with these products, um, they they have dosed very high um, and and without priming, which led to toxicity. And just to uh, make you aware that. In, in these kind of therapies, the animal experiments also needs to be done carefully because if you conduct a study in a typical manner, assessing safety at a very high dose without priming the animals, you will have a high degree of fatality in, in your animals. So, you know, you need to understand the drug and the mechanism very well when, when developing these kind of products. Um, I'm going to skip this. I've covered this in some way. Again, you know, what I would always preach is there needs to be a balance between the details that you that you that you provide and the and, and the detailed evaluation of the of all the elements that leads to first in human versus flexibility and all these finds its way into the protocol. Um, and and um, you know how you balance these two will dictate how you accounted for all the uncertainties in the translation between preclinical to clinical, which is uh, often a very challenging task. One who does that on a routine basis knows what I'm talking about. With that, I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention, and uh, we can perhaps take a few questions before I move on to the next presentation. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, Sparta is very, very interesting. Uh, talk about, I think you've compiled almost everything together to scaling up from uh, animal study preclinical to clinical and the first dose testing. Really, really, very interesting talk, uh, Dr. Sparta. It's very, very informative. Uh, I just ask you a question that uh, in Abiotron, we are yeah. uh, a young ophthalmologist, oncologist. Uh, uh, spoke to me some time back. On that basis, we initiated some studies also for monitoring the blood levels. This oncologist said that abiaterone is very expensive for uh, the patients to afford. So what he did is that he gave it with the help of uh, uh, high fat milk to increase the so for bioavailability of this drug. As a, so according to him, that can we reduce the dose based upon the bioavailability by heavy fat milk? And the subsequent, sub, some publication also came uh, supporting this. I hope this study, what we are doing with him, may, may also be coming up. But my question is, as you were involved in the study, 
what necess what uh, decision you have taken to make this drug to be taken in the empty stomach so the decision uh, to take the drug in empty stomach was dictated primarily due to the low variability okay. uh, in exposure under fasted state because as you will see um, in the package um, yes, and yes, some yes. other publications that your meal content is very very critical exactly. in dictating the extent to which you will see a food effect and food dependent augmentation of viability yes um in order to you know make it more acceptable and and not having that degree of variability in the patients uh, we decided to recommend it to be taken under fasted conditions i understand i understand the, 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 uh, right, yes. it has a tenfold food effect with high fat meal exactly exactly that's what we are observing and this guy says that the people are not able to afford uh, the cost of the drug by doing that way if i could reduce the dose of the drug i'm very happy with the patients so for you know we are going ahead with the trial of this to do the monitoring of avetron in uh, uh, plasma concentration of fat this is going on it's very interesting to talk to you about in this uh, i really had this question in my mind that what made them to go for Empty stomach. I think this similar case, like of cyclic swirin, we could see in this case also uh, variability in bioavailability. The second question is about uh, suppose if we try to look into uh, in some cases where you don't have a direct uh, indicators for PD, how do you select the uh, indirect indicators for PD, and how do you validate it? Is there any criteria for this uh, which is followed by industries? Yes, so I think uh, if there are no direct PD markers, our best get hope is that we find a biomarker that um, you know that uh, one could measure. But you have to be careful where that biomarker is. Is it proximal to your um, you know disease mechanism or is distal? And also, what kind of biomarker it is? Uh, there is a whole you know, we can spend about five days talking about biomarkers alone. Um, mm -hmm. Because oftentimes I have seen people make the mistake that they choose a biomarker which is easy to find and validate, but that biomarker neither, um, you know, accounts for the disease progression, nor does it account for a drug effect. And those biomarkers are basically useless because you cannot use it Absolutely. for anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the holy grail for biomarker is really um, trying to find what we call surrogate biomarkers. Right, right. There are only very few out there, and it's very hard to validate those. I think the first one that ever got validated was the, you know, was in hep, you know, HIV area where wow. um, the viral load count was. CD4 a CD4 count, I think it's mental, right? So well, after that, virology, you know, is using the viral load count. Copies, yes. Yeah. And the most interesting is in case you're working with CNS drugs, it's very difficult to understand about uh, the uh, PD in case of CNS uh, progression, and especially in case of Alzheimer's and other diseases, uh, where uh, the uh, indirect markers will be a problem, right? Yes. Um, the other area that where uh, there is a surrogate biomarker is HbA1c in case of diabetes. Diabetes, true, true, true. Which is true. which is very well accepted. It's, and it's, you can correlate. It's, it's, somehow it becomes it just sounds like a direct one. Yes, <laughs> it's like a direct one. It's interesting. I think we can talk for you know more and more than an hour on this this area. I think let's look for any other uh, question from anybody. Um, any other question? I think. Um, I think the people are highly mesmerized to know about it. That's good. Uh, okay. Uh, we don't have any. Oh, yeah. Anybody's asking questions. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, my question was relating to you presented uh, once about uh, determining the dose for a drug. So, my question is relating to uh, the maximum tolerated dose, or what is the maximum dose that can be given to a patient? So, do we have a protocol for determining such a dose? Um, 
could you define what do you mean by protocol like um, uh, or how how would we go about doing it like uh, say for example if you are taking a drug and you find out that this is a therapeutic dose fine but sometimes you need to increase the dose in certain patients you know you you probably because it is not effective like for example in diabetes you start with 1 mg glimepiride and then you move on to 2 probably 4 mg so but you should not go beyond 10 mg so how do you decide that you should not go beyond 10 mg i'm just taking a hypothetical example okay so there are there are two paradigms one is the pharmacokinetics driven the other is safety driven um so we would stop dose escalation if we see a saturation in exposure so let's say to using your example if we go from 1 to 2 and 2 to 4 and 4 to 8 once we see that the exposure doesn't change between 4 and 8 we would stop because there is nothing else you can get out of this drug at that point the second thing is used more red you know more commonly is the safety driven and uh, we get a sense of that um from our preclinical experiments um if there are you know let's say liver enzyme effects or cardiovascular effects we usually monitor them in post in human study and we define a safety threshold margin once we hit that threshold we stop and that becomes our our maximum tolerated dose but in many drugs you you will see that it it's almost impossible to define a mtd um particularly the drugs that are being made nowadays um you know it's it's virtually you know very very safe so um you can go as high as you want but what we do is you know we keep at least a 5 to 10 fold margin at least 10 fold margin from the noel dose uh, in a rodent or a non rodent species and we stop escalating after that once we reach that point we just stop okay thank you uh, sure. sir uh, one question with me uh, sir uh, you have given lots of information regarding the pkpd model so can we have some uh, simulation software we have for the academic purpose also uh, for the pkpd modeling yes so well, there are um, many 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 softwares out there uh, yeah, um depend what you want to do you know and what is your uh, objective for a simulation um it it ranges very widely from a, a, a novice user to a very experienced user and uh, you know i think in clinical pharmacology what has happened in past 25 30 years is uh you can model a lot of lot of the the biological processes now our knowledge of biology has has grown leaps and bounds so we see that coming in um into clinical pharmacology now and with that comes along many different softwares and tools and languages that people are using so you know that's that's a whole science by itself and I'll share with you some of those experiences in my next talk if I can get to it. I I'm, I'm yes, having yes, some difficulty in sharing. I don't know what's going on. Um but uh, bear with me. Um, yes. I think uh, it's a time to go to the next talk uh, Dr. Ajit. Uh, actually it's, it's, it might we must not forget that it's a night for him not to make him awake for more time. Let's move on to the second talk. Yeah. Let me see problems faced in R&D. Yeah, let me see if i can share um something I mean, is continuously has been speaking so <laughs> there's something going on with my screen i don't sure. know <laughs> i don't know what but uh yeah. so any question i think it i spent if it is uh, can can move with the second presentation and sir tell me how to proceed uh, should we have to have some break or we can continue with the second presentation um, let me try to load it up then maybe we can take a, a, a quick water break and then i can start but yes, let me yes, figure yes. out how to do this i'm i'm having real challenges here
Hey, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a very interesting talk. There's a lot more questions coming up. Definitely, people start thinking about. Well, see, basically, what happened is that in PKPD earlier there are some softwares which were freely available has become very expensive now all of a sudden. Yeah. And uh, almost uh, it has become a good platform for uh, you know the so software developers to sell the same algorithm for money. But what I always understand is that. In academically, when we try to teach them, that teach the students, we should take the teach them rock bottom fundamentals of pharmacokinetics and dynamics. It's uh, you know it's not a convention to teach them about the PD models. Okay, VPK models. Almost you know uh, most of the pharmacy students and pharmacology people they we, we study. But when it comes to PD, you know PD is very less discussed about uh, uh, in in the in the academic system. And then often we get a request that can we arrange for a workshop for even PK. So we are thinking of in Delhi Pharmacal Society, there was a, there was a request. So we thought of organizing a, a workshop for a month workshop means four sessions in a month to give a certificate course on PK. Somehow, you know, we need to make it possible. Then we can dial in like Dr. Partha for talking about PKPD once again. I yeah. think he's ready with his slides, right? I think we can go ahead with the next talk. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what I have noticed and, you know, I come from that same system, although, you know, many years ago, I think in, in many programs, uh, the emphasis on pharmacology was not there. So, you know, we, we never really had uh, a lot of uh, understanding. <laughs> Of PD. Give me one second. I need sure, to. Sure, 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 sure. Please, please. Take your time. Take your time. Yeah. Yes, Give me yes. one second. Sure, sure. Meanwhile, I uh, really thank you, uh, Pandian sir and Ajit, for holding the fort and uh, pitching in. <laughs> These <laughs> programs, they run for a week and uh, it's difficult to, uh, you know, in the online mode, sometimes you yes, feel yes. offline is <coughs> more uh, interactive. We miss the human touch, but uh, exactly. and we feel that uh, the message may not be going across because uh, to very difficult to assess across a screen how you, right. yeah, yeah, the message right. is being shared. But uh, with, you know, I feel that a monologue is always better than dialogue exactly. and sometimes uh, things are better understood after a dialogue. So if exactly. we have some stimulating conversation, even if it is not a query, just a conversation, it can stimulate minds into yes. thinking something uh, which, which I may not have caught but was implied. So I really thank you for putting in that kind of effort. It's really a big, big thing. Of course, Path Dr. Partha is... Uh, uh, taking the lead by you know giving us an insight into such heavy topics within such a short period of time but then uh, but um, uh, his you, talk can be his talk can be divided into four parts and yeah. can be dealt for four sessions easily easily so people can understand much much more better i believe so and right. uh, incidentally we are also recording this and uh, uh, right. uh, streaming it live on youtube so right. uh, we really don't know how many uh, participants on the youtube are watching this but uh, at least on this platform over uh, 60 people are already logged in and uh, yeah, yeah so that's quite an achievement and uh, exactly exactly and uh, he's PKPD people are PKPD people are interested that's great you know i'm very happy to know about it Usually people run away for PK. Oh, oh, because it's the, and uh, another uh, hats off to Dr. Patha for beating the biological clock. We are at least uh, uh, exactly. in the morning session. For us, we are fresh and he is doing this uh, in his time zone. It's night. So we really no. thank. Uh, is that uh, is that a painting from somebody we know, Dr. Patha, on the first no. night? No. Um, actually, you know, we commission um, these paintings from people who suffer suffer from schizophrenia or ADHD or um, you know some kind of mental disorder. Beautiful. And we use this as as part of our slide deck to share. I I didn't want to put in the name of the artist, but you know, 
uh, there is a slide deck, uh, you know, as an introduction to the slide deck, uh, there's always an introduction of the artist who put this thing together. It's, it's a six year old child. Uh, this is a pastel color painting who suffers from attention deficit disorder, which I'm going to talk a little bit today. It's very uh, different and it caught my attention and I had to mention it. Uh, it's really no, no, that's, different. That's good. That's good. And, uh, you know, and this person then developed some epilepsy in, you know, uh, uh, disorder. So I'm going to talk about both of those today. And, and we try to tailor it, you know, that's what we do uh, as Johnson & Johnson. You know, we are patient-centric company and uh, that's something we are asked to do. But uh, yeah. Um, that's that's a small pitch for Johnson. Um, but um, you know, thanks for your attention. I think I'll switch gear, and this presentation will be very different from my first presentation. Um, here, I'm going to touch upon three case studies to show how we utilize the knowledge and modeling to inform drug development uh, and, and basically improve the productivity. So um, I'm going to you know, skip this one, but focus on another paper. And these are very interesting papers that came out. This one was published in 2014 from AstraZeneca. Uh, they looked at their pipeline at that time. And uh, you know, I'm going to uh, focus your attention to the central stacked bar graph, which is the project closures. If you look at the preclinical phase one through phase three, you'll notice that in phase, uh, in preclinical and phase one, there are a lot of failures due to PK, PD and strategy, very little uh, in terms of efficacy, but lot on safety as one would imagine. But if you look at that same, um, picture in phase three, you'll see 88% of their drug, uh, uh, and this is a small number, the denominator is eight, but 88% of the drug failed because of lack of efficacy. And 12% failed due to, due to safety concerns. Now, when you go from uh, that to the reason for lack of clinical efficacy, the highest, the, the topmost two categories are that the target linkage to disease was not established or no validated model was available in early clinical development or preclinical development. And the second most common reason was the dose limited by compound characteristics of tissue exposure. Um, so one couldn't either reach the target or the drug didn't reach the target in high enough concentration to elicit an effect. Now with that in mind, I'm going to skip this one. I have shown this and talked about it in my previous uh, presentation, but the main message here that I want to leave you with is you have to know your exposure and your pharmacology starting in discovery and carry information through development via modeling and simulation. And in this situation, biomark are ideal uh, if you can find a, a biomarker that translates across species. Um, I'm going to skip this, we covered it. So this is an integrated view of modeling and drug development. Um, if you look at today's drug development paradigm, you know the cost of a typical drug development has crossed $1 billion. It's close to $1.5 to $2 billion and sometimes upwards based on the disease and uh, the kind of drug that one is developing. So in every sector and every sphere of this, um, everybody is utilizing more and more in silico um, processes and models to understand, um, you know, how to leverage the existing knowledge as number one. And number two, how can we uh, you know, reduce the number of studies or reduce the development time? I'm not going to go through each of these um, in a modeling 
um, um, topics because they could be, uh, um, if you look into the literature or some of the symposia and uh, you know uh, meetings that are being organized, each of these are a topic by themselves. But what I want to highlight is that the, the model informed drug development starts even with the basic biology, understanding the signaling pathways, understanding how a patient um, varies from the next patient in terms of um, genetics. And you probably in your session had a talk about omics. It's getting a more central um, you know, visibility in a drug development paradigm nowadays. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking into the, you know, different uh, omics kind of data um, to understand the disease heterogeneity, um, and and uh, you know, and and understanding that is becoming very critical, particularly for drugs that are, uh, you know, are are being developed for more focused therapies. So. Um, there are some fundamental differences in the way uh, we approach drug development and not when I say we, it's the industry in general. So on the left, you can see uh, the amount of information, the number of assumptions, uncertainty in predictions, prior information, and goals of modeling and simulation. And to the right, the second column is if your drug is nth in class, what I mean by that is it's not the first in class, but it's the second, third, fourth, or fifth. And then to the extreme right is the first in class, which is always, always very challenging. And you can see, you know, and, and it, it's kind of, kind of intuitive that as you go from nth in class to first in class, the amount of information that you have changes dramatically. With that, also the knowledge in the preclinical space changes, you know, very dramatically. Um, the number of assumptions goes up in case of first in class, which is typically quite low uh, for nth in class compound. Uncertainty in predictions are very very different. The prior information uh, for the nth in class is more quantitative, but for first in class is very qualitative. And the goals of M modeling and simulation is entirely different. For anything in class, we look at, uh, we use modeling and simulation for decision making because we have a lot of knowledge and uh, technology is, is, is well developed to leverage that uh, to inform and expedite the development process. Whereas in first in class, we are still in the learning mode. You know, we, we have a lot of uncertainties, we have a lot of gaps in our knowledge, and you know, we we have to deliberately work through and develop the program and keep learning as we go along. So if you look at this paradigm, um, what happens is a modeling and simulation is applied in, in some way, shape or form across the entire continuum of drug development. Uh, there are different kinds of efforts that are being put in, different kinds of models built, software is used. Uh, and the reason being that as you go from left to right, your uncertainty goes down and your confidence in the drug and the disease goes up. And you know this is the kind of crossover that we all have to appreciate to understand what the risks are in any drug development process, particularly for new molecular entities or new disease areas. Um, so the first example, which I'm going to share with you today is focuses on this, uh, the very early stages. Uh, this is the case one. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is the importance of right information for making decisions. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit about a, the clinical dose projection by bridging preclinical and clinical data for a first-in-class molecule. Um, 
this molecule is targeted towards rheumatoid arthritis. It's a very debilitating disease, uh, could hit um, in individuals at any stage. It comes in many different forms. Um, today, there are um, biologic uh, therapies, which are biologic response modifiers, which I, you know, which are a type of DMARDs, the older and more established therapies that were based on forty you know, glucocorticoids. corticoids. People use NSAIDs and analgesics, but the latter two mostly treat the symptoms, not the disease. Um, I'll talk about a H4 antagonist. This is a histamine-like receptor type 4. It is implicated in many inflammatory diseases where um, there is an infiltration of um, of uh, macrophages or monocytes. Um, and primarily H4 is implicated in asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, and colitis. But there are examples where it has been seen to play an active role in allergies, some forms of cancer, um, pain, and even um, irritable bowel diseases. Um, H4 is predominantly expressed in the the, the cells of the hematopoietic system you have uh, the, it it uh, works you know its main function is to trigger um, uh, migration chemotaxis um, some if it affects the mast cells it leads to inflammation um, it also uh, is expressed in monocytes, which are uh, active in differentiation and uh, reduced recruitment. Um, and obviously the dendritic and the T cells. And uh, the way it acts primarily is through um, altering the calcium homeostasis within a cell. Um, and the, 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 the ligand for this receptor is histamine. It triggers this, but uh, uh, obviously, you know, um, a, a treatment modality that would uh, competitively bind to H4, excluding histamine, uh, is, is thought to provide a therapeutic benefit in, in many of these diseases. So here is a drug um, that was studied and uh, um, what you can see is the total response uh, to the drug on the y x-axis is the time in weeks, and the DAS28 is the disease activity score. It measures the inflammation in 28 joints in the body, mostly in the extremities. And what you can see is in the placebo group, um, you see a very uh, small uh, effect. Uh, which is, um, you know, understandable. Um, in the treatment group, you see a robust effect, but also over time you see a plateauing. So it doesn't keep on improving over time. And this treatment, you know, there were two doses that were studied. Now, when you look at the inhibition of, or, or the effect on the disease progression um, as measured by DAS28, against exposure to this drug, one would see that there is no effect. In fact, it's counterintuitive that as the drug exposure goes up, you get worse and worse effects. But is it, is it true? Um, and that's where we look at the data slightly differently. And if you look at the data in this manner, you can see three clusters. One is the super responders where people get you know, extremely good effect. Then, then there are the, you know, the traditional responders where you see a exposure dependent improvement in symptoms. And then like any other disease, there are a group of non-responders, which in this case constitutes about 25% of the population. Um, now, when you look at the dose response, this is what you see. And this is the kind of variability that one would encounter in any clinical study. But what is very clear is like going from placebo 
to 30 to 100, you can see a drug effect, no doubt. Um, but you also see subjects who are getting worse over time. Not everybody improves. Now, how do you make sense of this data? So one way of looking at this is through change of DAS28 from baseline. Um, the dotted red line indicates the clinically meaningful change. Obviously, with the 30 milligram, you are in the range at 12 weeks, and these are all 12-week data, which we call the landmark analysis. The previously, what I showed you is, is the longitudinal data over time. And obviously, at 100 milligram, you see a, a big improvement. Now, if you now look at the, the simulated data at week 12 for placebo, the improvement is about 0.4 points, uh, which is consistent with the observed data that we had in the clinical study in the placebo. When you look at the 30 milligram, you know, we see a model-based simulated improvement of 0.8 in responders or 0.6 overall, which includes 25% non non-responder, which is in line with what we saw in the study. And for the 100 milligram dose, um, you know, the projected weighted reduction uh, in DAS score, which is improving, um, you know, smaller values or improvement is about 1.4. The clinical data at that dose, the observed data showed 1.3. <coughs> what we can say is the model that was built is predicting the outcome quite precisely in this particular disease and for this drug. Um, but how do we translate the uh, from preclinical knowledge? So there are two hypotheses that we have to set up. One is that the therapeutically effective doses in patients and the ED50 or the effective dose 50% value in rodents of anti-rheumatic drugs are linked through pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the various disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which in brief is called DMARDs. And the hypothesis too is that there is a relationship between ED50 values in animals and average therapeutic drug concentration in humans for DMARDs. Now with that, what we did was we looked at the classical uh, steroids and the, and the first generation drugs that were used in this area. So that's cyclosporine, methotrexate, prednisone, and dexamethasone. Now, when you look at the ED50 in animals in milligrams along the x-axis and correlate that with the steady state average therapeutic concentration along the y-axis, you see that there is a correlation, um, and uh, you can see where each of these drugs lie. Now, when you overlay um, the same information from the drugs that are being developed um, in that area, you can see that the correlation is much stronger, but it does have the same correlation. It has the same slope which gives us a confidence because now we have a model where we can plug in the ED50 from animals um, for any compound and we can say, okay, what is the steady state average therapeutic concentration we need? And based on that and the PK information for that compound, we could tailor a dose where we are expected to see efficacy in humans. So based on that, that's exactly what we did. We looked at the ED15 animals in mixed per cake per day, uh, you know, for two compounds of interest. The first one had a very high dose, which translated into uh, to humans based on that correlation I just showed you to 160 milligram per day. And the compound B, um, you know, had a 40 milligram dose of which translated into 260 milligrams. Now, all these are based on the free fraction translation. So um, one reason why we needed a higher dose for compound B in humans is because this molecule had a 
much greater plasma protein binding. So you need a high dose to have an equivalent free fraction. Um, so, um, so based on this, uh, you could see that one way of leveraging the information from preclinical to clinical, if you can develop these kind of relationship, becomes very easy. And you know we often use this technology and methodology wherever it's applicable to predict our human starting dose, and we can narrow the range, um, you know, from the from get go and do a very streamlined first in human study, and and uh, gather the safety information that we need. Um, the second example is sort of in the middle. It's between phase two and phase three, where we have less uncertainty about the drug and the disease. And, and we have a fair degree of confidence in, in our drug and the disease itself. Um, this is talking about epilepsy, where we are looking at the comparative effectiveness of a com new compound in patient with refractory partial epilepsy. Um, now, this one is not first in human, it's a next generation compound, so you can think of it as the nth compound in its class. Um, just quickly, you know, um, epilepsy is, uh, you know, known to most of us. It um, causes seizures, it has very different presentations, very different subtypes, and to the right is the, you know, where um, in the age group that gets most affected. And you can see it covers the entire spectrum. Only between ages three and five, we see a, a, a lower incidence rate and uh, we still don't understand why that is the case. Um, but, um, you know, we have patients in the pediatric realm and adults who, who does get these seizures. Um, so when we looked at the Medline search on, you know, this was, it's a very old example. Um, we found 32 trials representing about 9,000 patients, 99 treatment arms and 11 drugs. And those are listed here. The reason I highlighted topiramate is for two reasons. One, it's a Janssen compound, which is generic now but also it's one of the most effective compound out there for treating partial onset seizure. Um, the two uh, primary endpoints that are commonly measured in these clinical studies are median person reduction in seizure frequency and the proportion of patients with 50% or greater reduction in seizure frequency, which we define as responders. The tolerability endpoint that we were interested in is the proportion of patients who withdraw from the studies due to any adverse events. Um, the other information that we know affects the outcome is the between trial variability, the mean number of anti-epileptic drugs that the patients are on board because these are always done in an adjunctive setting, not as a monotherapy. A percent of patients receiving one or more anti-epileptic drugs. The baseline seizure frequency, uh, obviously the type of seizure and most common anti-epileptic drugs, et cetera. Uh, we'll not focus too much on the types of seizure because we are interested in finding how this new molecule would work in partial onset seizure. So here is, um, you know, um, a plot of the seizure frequency percent change for each of these molecules against different doses. And you can see that they all follow a very, um, you know, um, predictable uh, relationship, a dose response relationship, if I may say so. The compound X is colored in red. Um, you can see that um, it has a very sharp dose response, but then there it, it, it plateaus out, the effect plateaus out quite quickly, whereas in case of the other molecules, there is, uh, you know, a, a, a continuous improvement over the dose range that was studied. Each data point is a study. The, 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 the bar, um, uh, you know, the lines 
um, up and down the data point uh, is the standard error of the mean of response. Um, what we what was done in this case was everything was calibrated to topiramate because in order to understand the relative effectiveness of a molecule, you need to calibrate the effectiveness of every molecule to a common standard. And you know this is a very simple statistical um, you know maneuver one one adopts. And you can see that you get an Emax type model where when you express all the doses in terms of topiramate equivalent dose, all these drugs line up very nicely. And this is done after correcting for the free fraction and the potency of these molecules relative to topiramate. What we did was also, we knew there could be a relation, a, a difference between the baseline seizure frequency of less than 10 or greater than 10. We chose 10 as arbitrary uh, cutoff point um, based on the severity of the disease. And what was quite interesting is to see that the, the two profiles are very, very similar. So both the, uh, all these drugs have a very similar exposure response relationship. And, and that is not affected by the baseline severity of the disease. We also looked at the person responders and uh, you know we capped it off at 50% response and you can see that the compound X has a very flat response curve, whereas one could see a continued improvement in percent uh, responder rate as the doses increase. Um, this is the percent of dropout due to all the adverse events. And you can see that some of these drugs, there's a pretty steep dropout. For example, in case of oxcarpazepine, uh, there is a very steep dropout going from 1500 and beyond. Um, drugs like levacetidem, which is Capra, is kind of flat. Um, and so is the compound X. There's not much of a difference. On an average, we see 10 to 12% or 15% dropout at very high doses. Now, with that data, I'm not going to show the math. Um, what you can do is, is a combined, uh, what I call the therapeutic index plot. So let me explain this. On the y-axis is the seizure frequency median percent change from baseline. And on the x-axis is the dropout due to AE. So the the bubble that you see for each of these compounds, uh, horizontally, it demonstrates the variability uh, along the x-axis and vertically it demonstrates the variability along the y-axis. And this is a composite of all the studies that was done with that compound. So what jumps out from this plot is this, that if you focus on the gray, bubble, which is the topiramate 400 milligram per day, the drug is very, very active. Because if you go um, along the y-axis, you can see about, on an average, 35% reduction in seizure frequency, mean seizure frequency from baseline. But the drug also causes about 7 to 8% dropout. Compared to that, the compound X, which is in pink at the top left-hand corner, you can see that the drug is very safe. It causes very little dropout. However, it has lowest drug effect of all the compounds in the class. Now, what does it tell us is, you know, of all the doses that we have tested, we cannot go any further because if you recall the plots that I showed you, that the effect, the drug effect plateaus beyond 1200 milligram. And even with that high dose, we can achieve maximum of 20 point change in the median, 20% uh, point change in the median relative to baseline, whereas some of the other products achieves 30 or 40 percent change. So you could decide whether you want to move forward with such a compound in phase three or you want to kill the development in phase two. 
And this is the power of um, using the published data and the knowledge of compounds in that disease area to see whether your new compound is truly differentiated from all others that you have to compete with in the market. And some of this you have to also take into consideration could become generic and there the price difference will, will be, you know, uh, will be uh, uh, um, unsurmountable if you, if you cannot show a clear differentiation uh, with the existing you know, therapies that are out there. Um, just to show how good the predictions were, you can see this is the, the trial outcome. The central line is the median outcome that uh, the model predicted. The dotted line is the 90% confidence interval around that outcome prediction. And these are different studies. You can see that uh, you know, the central tendency uh, the median outcome was, was uh, mostly within the predicted range. But um, in a one study, we just fell out of, uh, at a dose of, I, I forgot what that was, 450. Uh, we just fell out of that band, but it's pretty close. But all the studies fell within that uncertainty band. And, uh, you know, this was done, this prediction was done prior to phase three and the data points that I'm showing here were in different colors with vertical error bars um, came in much later. So you can see that this tool could, um, in a modeling and simulation done right, could give you an indication of what outcome you might anticipate in your phase three studies for a given drug in a given indication. So um, some of the choices that uh, you can make and, and uh, the, you know, the observations are obviously, you know, the drug is less potent. The, the one that you have now is, is, is um, Participants, please mute yourself. Participants, please mute yourself. Yeah, there are a few other things that one needs to consider is whether the patient population that we have now is less sensitive because, um, you know, as the as different therapies have come along we are getting the refractory population in an adjunctive setting. So what we see now with, an, with the new drug is could simply be because of, of patients who are less sensitive. Um, and finally, the potential factors that indicate more severe patients, we have to look at the number of concomitant AEDs, baseline seizure frequency. Uh, year of study completion gives you a sense of, you know, how sensitive your patient populations were at different times in that, uh, in that uh, trajectory. And finally, the number of failed AEDs. Um, the unfortunate thing is that this information is not consistently reported in literature, but we do our best to find the information. Um, finally, the last example, I'll quickly go over it is really, you know, in, 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 in a, at a stage where uh, it's between phase two and phase three, but mostly between phase two and two B, but we have a balance in the, the degree of uncertainty and the confidence in a molecule and the disease. And uh, this talks, uh, talks about ADHD. And I'm going to talk about an example of optimal dose finding in phase two and you know, what doses to carry into phase three. It's a novel agent first in class, but ADHD is a very known, well-known disease. So just to give you a sense of what ADHD is, it's uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. And these are some of the words that people use um, to describe ADHD and, and you know, if you see, a, uh, the size of the font actually 
denotes the frequency at which people relate these terms to the disease. So self-control, behavior impulsive, uh, having problem with executive function, memory, difficulty in working, et cetera, having difficulty with relationship um, are, are the key features of this disease. And then you have these you know, attention, hyperactivity, uh, difficulty with problem solving, uh, difficulty with uh, paying attention at school, self-control, et cetera, um, are, are, are some of the minor, um, you know, some of the minor um, symptoms that that is expressed. So there are many different kinds of drugs, but broadly they fall into two distinct categories. One is the stimulant, the other, uh, the second one is non-stimulant. And many of you are very familiar with these compounds. There are generic forms all over the market. Um, and uh, the compound that I'm going to talk about today falls under the non-stimulant category. So here is the data from the phase 1b or 2a study that was conducted. So if you look at the placebo three dose, you know, two dose groups, 10 and 30, and uh, on the lower right-hand panel is the mean response. Um, this is, the typical ADHD rating scale total score, this, these are composite scales, which looks at many different dimensions uh, of the disease. Um, we looked at the exposure response. So the first thing we looked at is the insomnia because most of the stimulants and some of the non-stimulants have uh, a profound effect on insomnia that people cannot sleep. And you can imagine if somebody is taking a stimulant, you cannot sleep. Like, you know, you drink coffee or you drink, uh, you know, sodas, um, you have caffeine, it stimulates you to do and prevents you from going to sleep. So when we look at the placebo, let me explain this plot. So on the y-axis are the subject numbers. Um, the horizontal lines are the adverse events or insomnia that we observed. The X denotes subject who discontinued and along the X axis are the days from, uh, of treatment, from start of treatment to end of treatment. The different color codes are insomnia of different severity. So placebo, you know, we saw a few subjects with um, uh, insomnia, some were moderate, most of, you know, and some were mild, there was one discontinuation. With 10 milligram, you can see that there are few subjects popping up early on in the program where they're having severe insomnia, but then they adjust to the, to, to the treatment. There were two dropouts. What you will see strikingly different is when you go to 30 milligram dose, there are not many subjects with, with the moderate, uh, insomnia, the number of severe insomnia also goes up, but what is striking is the number of dropouts. And so if you think of it, frankly, this dose is intolerable. Um, and you know, given the size of the study, almost every patient experienced this AE. Um, we also looked at the, the, in, the probability of getting insomnia uh, in those who were treated with prior stimulant versus no prior experience with stimulant drugs. Um, we modeled the data. So the, the, the square symbols are model data and the dots are observed data. And you can see that we can predict based on the model that was built, what is the likelihood of or what's the probability of the, of the subjects getting insomnia at the 10 milligram dose and 30 milligram dose in both categories where they are experienced with a, with a stimulant drug where, and where they are, uh, do not have that experience. And not surprisingly, you know, stimulants do cause a lot of insomnia. So people get acclimatized to that. 
so their effect was lower compared to, or their probability of getting insomnia was much lower compared to that, uh, you know, those subjects who had no prior uh, stimulant experience. Um, so when you look at in a logistic sense, you can see that there is a strong relationship uh, by age as well. So elderly people do get more insomnia at all, at both doses. And the relationship is quite striking. You can see that the slopes are very, very steep um, and, and uh, you know, and it, it's steeper for the 30 milligram dose group than for the 10 milligram dose group. So the question is, um, you know, are we limited to the highest dose of 10 milligram? And if so, we have only studied two doses. So what should we test? phase two B, which is our pivotal study before we, you know, choose one or two doses to go into phase three. So we took, uh, you know, we, we embarked on a PB, P, uh, PKPD analysis. And this is the data you are leaving. But this time what I did is I created a color scheme. So when you look at this data carefully, you will see that there are subjects who responds to the drug, but there are also subjects who get worse. And this is an important element of developing a PKBD model because you have to, in, in order to be predictive, uh, you have to develop a model that can both predict a improvement in uh, after treatment and also worsening of the disease following treatment. So with that, we looked at uh, uh, this data slightly differently. We looked at the placebo corrected mean change from baseline, which is to your right. It's the same data, but you can see now the scale is shrunk because we have a huge placebo effect. But what was also interesting was we detected a huge delayed placebo response. As you can see here, it takes about you know, five to seven days um, to have an onset. And then you see a continuous, continuous improvement in the placebo arm. But also we see a delayed, P, uh, delayed PD effect after treatment of the drug. And those two have a different time scale. So we build this model. I'm not going to belabor, but the pharmacodynamic model, which is highlighted in yellow, gives us the flexibility of predicting both improvement and um, you know, worsening of the disease. What I would say is this is a concept which is very common in PKPD world is for drugs where we cannot measure the drug in the brain, which is true for ADHD and epilepsy. We imagine a, a, a sham compartment, which is uh, which we call uh, effect compartment, and we believe that the drug in the effect compartment is responsible for driving the ultimate form for dynamics. So, um, you know, this is a very standard model that was developed about 20 years ago by a gentleman out of UC San Francisco called Lu Shaina. And uh, this model has stood the test of time and uh, we use this very routinely. Um, so I'm showing you the model data. This is the, the median uh, and the 90% prediction interval. You can see all the data points are within that blue band as they should be. Um, and uh, the lower right-hand uh, plot shows the prediction, which are the lines and the observed median data. So you can see that the model predicts quite well the drug effect. What we also noticed is there we couldn't tell uh, you know, a, the difference between 10 and 30 milligram dose. And this was good because we could achieve similar effect with the 10 milligram dose with a much lower side effect compared to 30 milligram dose. Uh, so we took that model and we simulated uh, the, a large clinical trial. And this is what we found is that uh, the different doses that we could have studied, I'm sorry, um, 
from zero to 30. Obviously we cannot go beyond 30. Um, you know, we will see uh, about two to three point improvement over this dose range because placebo will give you um, a seven point decline median change from baseline and the highest dose gives you 10. So we have roughly a three point improvement. We can also find out or estimate the range. So you can see that the upper 95 percentile uh, shows that there will be a handful of subjects who will worsen upon, you know, whose disease will worsen um, during treatment. Uh, and based on that, you can see that if you go anywhere beyond 10 milligram, you're going to hit a plateau because you can see between 3, 5, 10, and 30, there's hardly any difference. So uh, the doses that we selected was uh, basically, you know, 1, 3, and 10. Um, and uh, we then decided, you know, we ran the study and the results that we got were very much in line with the prediction. So I'll conclude by saying that the, all three case studies highlight the need for you know, very strong understanding of pharmacology. And when I say pharmacology, not just in terms of efficacy, but also safety as well, because we pick up the do our doses based on the therapeutic index or the therapeutic margin. Uh, translatability of pharmacodynamics from in vitro and in vivo models could allow better assessment of drugs effect in humans um, through you know, appropriate use of biomarkers. But here, I want everyone to be cautious that one is using the right animal models or the right experiments to translate, using the right biomarkers to, to inform, uh, you know, decisions made uh, Either to initiate human studies or to or to continue developing the drug in humans. Um, and and you know the last bullet talks about uh, you know which is a foregone conclusion that a well-designed early clinical development program is a strong determinant of a compound's developability as a treatment option. And what I've found is true like not only in our hands but uh, you know if you reflect on the example i showed you from pfizer's pipeline or astrazeneca's pipeline time and again we have seen that having confidence in your biology uh, slash pharmacology and exposure is a critical success factor if you don't have one or the other the chances of succeeding or, or moving a molecule from bench to bedside is, is, is highly unlikely. So I think that's my last slide. I'll stop there and see if anybody has any questions. It's a very over exhausting lecture to talk about all the models, speedy models about the rear drug situations. I most appreciate uh, Dr. Partha for this wonderful lecture on this, which is rarely discussed at anywhere to this extent what you're talking about it. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it, it's uh, not something that uh, I have seen, you know, being practiced a lot, um, exactly. but I think this is the future of clinical pharmacology and future of drug development. As I said, you know, with the high cost of development, we just cannot continue um, the way we 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 did drug development 20, 30 years ago. We we have to adopt. We have to learn and become smarter. Yes, I understand that because it's a. It's a big area, I think, uh, one need to familiarize all about. Yeah. Uh, do we have any questions from participants?
I guess not everybody's tired. <laughs> Hello. Yes, okay. sir. Hi, sir. This is Dr. C.R. Patil here. Yeah, uh, please. This lecture is really uh, mesmerizing as Dr. Uh, Elpandi uh, said. Actually, uh, this kind of drug discovery is happening in industries. And in academia, we have to keep on training our students and enable them to understand what really happens there. So, uh, uh, can uh, Dr. Patha uh, put some light on how we academicians can enable our students and what kind of training we should take to enable our students to uh, cope up with this kind of uh, uh, model which is happening in drug discovery? Sure. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a policy maker, but if I were <laughs> one, I would say in, in India particularly and, and many of the Asian countries, the emphasis in, in pharmaceutical field is still very much geared towards pharmaceutics and uh, drug manufacturing. And if you look at it and think about it carefully, that's a space where chemical engineers and process engineers are much more adept in, in, um, in a conducting those kind of um, work and research. They, they are, you know, they have the knowledge of running big plants and manufacturing. Pharmacists, you know, I can reflect on the courses that I took. I took chemical engineering for one year. Um, during my undergraduate. And I found it very interesting and useful, but, you know, I think reflecting back, I, it would be more useful if I had more in-depth uh, instruction and courses in pharmacology, understanding the pharmacodynamics, understanding the biological processes, because that's what pharmacists are more experienced in. We live at the intersection of biology and, you know, and mathematics and, uh, and uh, you know, biochemistry and things of that. We work as an integrator. So, you know, there is a big disconnect in my mind between what is taught and what, what, it, uh, what would, uh, you know, what uh, it would take to get into this area. Yes, I think uh, Dr. Pato is trying exactly the correct one. In our, in, in our academic setup, sometimes we don't, um, you know, when I remember that when I took a lecture on PD, uh, PKPD coalition about the models used in PKPD coalition, in one of the QAP programs, I, I think I believe that maybe five, six years back, I took a lecture on this. You will not believe that the participants, I could see the face of participants. I mean, uh, uh, they are. Uh, they need a little more uh, academic uh, uh, session on fundamentals, rock bottom fundamentals of PD. Yeah. I mean, understanding the PD into more. Uh, it's not just a, you know a general pharmacology rushed through that uh, where we have no information about the receptor dynamics and converting the uh, mechanism into some numbers into a graph on different type of styles through which it can be expressed. That kind of uh, thing has not been pursued anywhere. In a medical school, when I take the same lecture for the medical students, again, we have the same problem. They just don't want to learn pharmacokinetics. Right? Yeah. So we have a problem both you know, on the medical side also and the pharmacy side also that PK in PD is really, really, a, I would say, a real cup of coffee, which is not tasted so far. That's what I always feel. But uh, Dr. Belpandian, uh, I'll, I'll just share my perspective um, not not to say that you know we all have to change course tomorrow, but if you look at the therapeutics of tomorrow, um, what is coming? These will be all biologics. If you think yes. of COVID nineteen, yes, yes, you, yes, you yes. cannot develop a vaccine unless you understand biology and immunology and yes. the interplay of different you know T cells, how the T cell signal how the antibodies are produced, how, you know, why certain antibodies are long lived, et cetera. You know, yes, yes. the era of small molecule drug development, we, we know a lot and, you know, we can, we can move forward, but 
it's a we are entering into an era of biologics, a very targeted therapy. Yes, Look yes, at the yes. cancer treatment today. You know, the immuno oncology is all targeted therapy, and there is no room for PK. And you know, in your field, you cannot do PK in ocular diseases. There's no way yes. you can say, you know, you come to my office, I'll sample your vitreous. Um, so, you know, we, we are getting into a, a time where we, we have to change. Otherwise, we will become, you know, uh, redundant in, in industry very, very quickly. True, true, true. I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, almost, uh, you know, you see every now and then we get newer drugs coming from biologicals. Yes. And the biologicals, we have no idea about, I think the pharmacy school curriculum is yet to adopt biologicals and immunologicals. Uh, absolutely. And uh, yesterday when I was taking a lecture on yeah. biointelligence, artificial intelligence in drug discovery, I was talking about the turbo flu vaccine discovery, about turbo flu vaccine discovery. I mean, such a type of thing is going on one end and we are still uh, struggling with the fundamental basics. Really, sometime you know, it's uh, we have we time to move ahead and to other disciplines yeah. need to be incorporated into the curriculum. And I think you know what I see even in in US and in Europe, I see a lot of biomedical engineering, um, you know, cell biology people coming into industry because that's the kind of Research, which is a requirement that is needed in, in cell biology. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. <laughs> I think we need to uh, we need to go ahead further with. Uh, I think there need, there need to be a, a, a decision uh, together to make little more move towards. But of course, that the boundaries, the real boundaries of pharmacology and pharmacy are getting now pushed beyond it. And we should allow things to merge up. I mean, uh, at the higher end, we see everything. Artificial intelligence, we never thought that it is coming into drug discovery. But now we see that it's just, uh, you know, every most more than 20 companies are into AI. And uh, without AI, I think future is going to be bad. And absolutely, it's a data science. So we need to have <clears throat> the freedom of uh, those who are having a graduation, post-graduation, getting into other domains to get more expertise. That's a way that you know you develop unique uh, capabilities among teachers, even to teach students. I, I would only call teachers to train themselves. That's a best. Yeah, thing. that's it. That's what is needed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, artificial intelligence came into drug discovery many years ago through cheminformatics. I think you know when you look at the disease segmentation, yes. and how the biology is is um, similar across different disease pathways. That, that came in about 15 years ago, but where it has come today is, is that we are using artificial intelligence to not only design a molecule and to um, identify the right disease for a given molecular feature, but we are also using that to select patient population. Yeah. Because right now, you know, treating everybody is not an option. We need more targeted therapy that treats and cures. Like, you know, about five years ago, if someone said, I'm going to find a cure for hepatitis C, I would say, yeah, in your dreams. But, you know, <laughs> the two drug combination from Gilead, you know, treats and cures hepatitis C. We are moving, you know, it, it's, it's more like we are moving from a paradigm of managing disease to curing disease. Exactly. And that's a big leap, you know, we, we never had that. Oh, yes, we look for it for more across domain expertise in everything to get a little more, I think people should open up their mind to accept new things and to adopt not getting into the conventional way of doing things. You know, yesterday I was telling about uh, the, uh, all the participants that still as, a, you know, I'm an editor of Indian General Physiology Pharmacology in the pharmacology section. I still get the papers, most of the papers coming to me are from, uh, you know, extract of this leaf, or extract of that leaf. And with that, you go for animal model, 
anti ulcer activity anti inflammatory activity you know that kind of papers are coming in so i think the teachers need to be you know to, to go one step ahead uh, to go more inside the uh, uh, to adopting newer type of techniques a newer type of uh, you know thinking has to change the science is a vast field if people can use any domain yeah i agree with you so, so uh, i think uh, there's no more questions we should allow dr patha to sleep please if you have a quick <laughs> question ask it otherwise uh, don't have to hold him back <laughs> good so no, happy, dr patha good to have this conversation because you know um um uh, rajini knows that you know it's it's been or you know my mission to at least bring some of this knowledge that we have here back to india and change the thinking you know in whichever way we can and uh, you know this is a in a small step in that direction but feel free to ask questions you know there is no wrong question so it's it's really up to you oh that's great so um sir uh, dr partha please uh, allow me to uh, present this um, certificate to you as a small token gesture of all the uh, effort you've taken and uh, i request dr pandian and dr uh, ajit to please do the honors congratulations to you and thank you so much for sparing your time and uh, putting in so much of energy i know what you're uh, talking about uh, what we started at and i know this is just a step in that direction and we have to take it forward where we start this kind of course this is training the trainer and uh, we need to get across to our young research scholars upcoming trainers future trainers into this track so that uh, we can think big and do something big together so your help in this direction will always be solicited and appreciated thank you so much for sparing your time and i'll share your email with all the participants and uh, with dr vel pandian so that they can stay connected with you and i'm sure you'll be happy to uh, uh, answer any queries as uh, if there are any Yes, uh, thank sure. you, Rajini. Um, I I want to thank you sincerely for um, organizing this and for inviting us from Johnson. Um, you know, we'll be happy to help in whatever way we can to to usher in this you know the new era in pharmaceutical you know, sciences and you know whatever we can do in that respect. I think you know we'll be very eager and and. Okay, thank you thank you very much dr partha yeah, for joining us so i think uh, it was possible despite the pandemic to have you here uh, because we did this in the webinar mode so in a way um, the online mode served us better uh, we net took it as an opportunity and uh, took it for the better so let's hope we get out of this pandemic all safe and sound and meet off campus and yes, uh, on yes. campus and on in person campus. in near sure. future Thank you and take yeah. care. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Dr. Have Prata. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. So, uh, participants, before we break for the lunch, I just want to share a small piece of information with you that we'll be today logging in at uh, 2 o'clock. And um, uh, initially, for a brief period of half an hour, we will be... Uh, um, uh, celebrating the World Heart Day, so I request you all to uh, join in at two o'clock. And following two thirty, we will have a panel discussion on a very important uh, topic: how to develop our organizations as a COVID training and research centers. So please uh, make a note. I think it's there on the WhatsApp group uh, that uh, we will be logging in at two o'clock. Same, uh, same ID, uh, same platform for World Heart Day celebrations, followed by. Uh, panel discussions. Enjoy your lunch and we'll be back soon. Thank, Thank you, you Ajit. Thank you. Thank you so much.